I guess today we're going to be talking about animals. And before we actually start talking about animals too much, we want to talk about what makes an animal an animal. And we're talking about a cell level. So on a cell level, all animals are multicellular. They're also all eukaryotic. In addition, they're all heterotrophic. They have to eat. They can't do photosynthesis. And unlike a lot of other kinds of organisms, they don't have cell walls. There are no cell walls. So any organism that has cells with these four characteristics, multicellular, eukaryotic, heterotrophic, and having no cell walls, these organisms are animals. What we're going to talk about today, though, are the first three phyla of animals, the most simple animals out there. By far, the most simple animals are in a phylum called porifera, which means they have a lot of pores. Uh, these animals are the sponges. They're really simple in that they don't have any tissues or any organs. They're simply clumps of cells. Because they don't have systems or tissues or organs, they don't have any systems either. So there's no circulatory system. There's no nervous system. They're completely dependent on things like diffusion and osmosis to move uh, materials around inside their body. They also lack a body cavity. They don't need it because they don't have any organs. In addition, their embryo development is a little bit different than that in most animals. They, they're not triploblastic. And that means that during embryonic development, their blastula never organizes itself into those three germ layers. They, they don't have a gastula. They only have um, zygote and then blastula. No, not, they don't have the three germ layers that most animals have during embryonic development. In terms of what they eat, they filter materials out of the water, things like algae and protists. Many of them are hermaphroditic, which means one organism contains both sex organs. During most of their life, they're sessile, which means they can't move. The exception to that is right after sexual reproduction. Right after egg and sperm join together and fuse during fertilization, they make a larva. This larva can swim, and it goes out and swims. It finds a nice rock, glues itself to that rock, and then grows into what we call as a sponge, a normal sponge. Now, in terms of how they eat, you can see the pores on the side of the sponge. These pores allow water to come into the central cavity. And lining the central cavity on both sides are cells called collar cells. Look sort of like this. These cells have a flagella. They pull water into themselves. And while the water's in there, these cells filter out, like I said before, algae and protists. And that's how they eat. So these, these collar cells, these guys are the filters. And you can see they line that entire central cavity. Once the water has been pulled in through the pores, it leaves out through this big hole in the top called the ostomy. Let me back up for just a minute. In terms of support, sponges don't really have skeleton, but they do have some material in there that acts sort of like rebar, sort of like uh, support beams. That can be either a protein called spongin. It can be little glass-like particles made of silicon dioxide called spicules. Or it can be more bone-like material, limestone, uh, calcium carbonate pieces. In terms of how they reproduce, sponges can reproduce asexually through a process called budding, which basically means a, a sponge, a piece grows off, sort of almost like a little tumor that breaks off and forms another sponge. Or they can reproduce sexually. Um, and in the sexual version, sperm and eggs are released into the water those come together during fertilization and they make this larva, this flagellated larva, which looks something like a protist. This thing will swim around, find a rock, glue itself to it, grow into an adult sponge. Most sponges naturally don't have much color to them. But the sponges that you see in the Caribbean and different tropical areas oftentimes are really colorful. That's because sponges oftentimes have symbiotic relationships with algae. And these algae will grow inside the sponge. They'll do photosynthesis. They'll provide the sponge with some sugar. 
And in return, this fund provides um, housing and also support and protection. And there's some pictures of some sponges. These are probably what most sponges would look like by themselves. And here's some really colorful sponges, um, colorful due to the symbiotic relationships with the algae. The next phylum we want to talk about is this group called Nidaria. This group includes things like jellyfish, uh, sea anemones, and coral. Those are the main members of this group. Their embryos typically are diploblastic, which means that they have two germ layers. Their blastula organizes itself into a, an inner layer called the endoderm and the outer layer called the ectoderm. All Nidarians that we know of are aquatic. They all live in the water. Most of them live in the ocean. Most of them are marine. And at least during most of their life cycle, they have radial symmetry, which means their body is arranged with some central disc with pieces radi ra radiating out, sort of like the spokes on a wheel. That's radial symmetry. Usually, they have a mouth end, the oral end, and an end away from the mouth, the aboral end or a boral. And in most species, there's no head. During most um, of the life cycles of most Idarians, there's two different body shapes that they have, the polyp and the medusa. Let's look at what that looks like. Here's a polyp. These polyps grow usually attached to a rock on the bottom of the ocean. They reproduce asexually by budding. But the bud then grows into this thing, which is called the medusa, sort of like an inverted bale with hair. This thing is what we normally think of when we think of jellyfish. It swims around in the water. It reproduces sexually, creates sperm and eggs. Those swim through the water, go through fertilization, create a zygote. That grows into a planula, a larva, which will find a rock, glue itself down, and grow into this thing called the polyp. So that's the life cycle of your typical Nadarian. It has a, an asexual stage, and then it has a sexually reproducing stage. Also, while we're here, let's look at the sort of the basic body shape of most Nadarians. Most Nadarians have two layers of cells in their body. They have a, a, an ectoderm and a gastroderm, an outer layer, which we sort of see here in purple, and an inner layer of cells called the gastroderm, which means stomach skin to some extent. In between there, in between those two layers, they have this tissue called the mesoglea, which is sort of a jelly-like material that fills up their body, mesoglea. Um, most cnidarians have a big cavity in the middle called the gastrovascular cavity. Now, if you look at that word, those two pieces should tell you something. Gastro means stomach. Vascular means like blood vessels, vessels. So this cavity acts as both their digestive system and also as their circulatory system. Food comes in only one opening, the mouth. But notice there isn't an, an, another opening. The mouth is the anus. So the food goes into this opening. It goes down in here, it gets digested. Waste come out the same end. And while the food is in here, it gets moved around through this gastrovascular cavity, which you see in orange. So that's the way the food's digested. It's also the way the nutrients are dispersed through the cell. And in addition, it's how other materials like waste and oxygen move through the cell as well. So that's the gastrovascular cavity. It's a one-way system. One way in, same way out. Let me back up for a second. So there's, a, there's our information about the gastrovascular cavity. It serves as, there's an opening that serves as both the mouth and the anus. Usually it's encircled by tentacles. These tentacles have special cells on them. Sometimes they're called nidocytes. A type of nidocyte is called the nematocyst. And these are the stinging cells. These help them catch their food and also protect them. So nidarians have nidocytes and nematocysts, stingers. Uh, 
Um, most cnidarians are a little bit more complicated than sponges. They have a simple nerve net, which helps them to respond to certain things. Things like needing to fire off their stingers. They have uh, a very simple nervous system, usually with two kinds of nerves. Some nerves that run length, the length of the body, longitudinal, and some that work more in a circle. Um, in terms of the reproduction, we already mentioned how that they usually have an asexual part of the cycle uh, where they bud. That's almost always in the polyp stage. And they typically also have a sexual stage. Uh, that's usually in the medusa stage where they uh, release gametes, form a larva, and go from there. They have no excretory or respiratory systems. Um, excretion and respiration are taken care of by diffusion and osmosis. They also are lacking that central body cavity because they have basically no organs. They're very simplistic animals. And again, some examples of nidarians are jellyfish, sea anemones, coral, and also a freshwater version of these organisms. And this freshwater version is a lot like um, a sea anemone. It's called a hydra. There's three main classes in the phylum Nidaria. Hydrozoa are the hydras. Scyphozoa, those are the jellyfish, what we normally think of as jellyfish. And then anthozoa, and this word literally means flower animal. So these are your sea anemones. They look more like plants really than they do animals. But they're animals because they're multicellular, uh, heterotrophic, eukaryotic, and their cells lack cell walls. So on a cell level, they're animals. They typically don't have the medusa stage. Usually they're only polyps. So there's some pictures. Here's our sea anemone. Here's coral. There's a, what's called a Portuguese man o -war. And you can see that right here, it's caught a fish with its uh, nematocyst and its tentacles. And then here's your typical jellyfish. All right, the other group that we want to talk about today is a phylum called platyhelminthes. This word literally means flat worms, flat worms. They're dorsoventrally flat, which means they're flattened from the back toward the belly. So in height, they're flat. These worms don't have segmentations, which limits their mobility to some extent. They have a definite head. They do have a head, and in that head are located most of their sensory organs. They're said to have cephalization. Anytime you see these letters together, C-E-P-H, usually also A-L, that refers to the head. Cephalization means that sense organs are concentrated in that head area. That's a big advantage for animals. These uh, flatworms, some of them are carnivorous. Most all of them are carnivorous. They can be free-living. Or they can be parasitic. They can live inside other organisms and cause damage to them. They typically do not have a body cavity because they don't have many organs. They're acelomate. They have bilateral symmetry, which means that if you took their body and you drew an imaginary line down the middle, that this side and this side are basically mirror images of each other. That's bilateral symmetry. During embryonic development, their blastula organizes itself into three germ layers and forms a gastrula. So they're said to be triploblastic. They have three layers in the, in the embryonic development stage. They also have two long nerve cords that run through the length of their body and branch out to form smaller nerves. So they're a lot more complicated than jellyfish. They take in food and excrete waste through one opening, sort of like your pharynx. It's sort of like your throat, a throat-like opening. There's uh, three main classes in the phylum platyhelminthes. The first one is called a trematoda. This group, group includes the flukes. These worms are almost always parasitic. Um, they oftentimes get into the blood vessels and abdomen, the uh, stomach area of humans. And once they get in there, they can burrow uh, through the skin. Or actually, they can get into you by burrowing through your skin to get into your blood vessels. One of the most common diseases in the world is a worm disease called schistosomiasis. 
people tend to get this by wading or swimming in freshwater ponds and lakes. And this worm will then burrow in through the people's skin and get into their bloodstream from there. The second class is a class called Cestoda. This group mostly includes tapeworms. These two are parasitic. They're really flat, really long. Uh, they get into your body typically by eating when you eat undercooked meat. And their cysts, which are found in the meat, dissolve in your digestive system and out come the worms. They typically will burrow into the muscles of your body eventually and form cysts. Tapeworms can be dangerous. Most of the time they're going to live in your intestines and basically just suck up your nutrients. But their, their larvae can get into your brain and cause some serious issues from there. Um, we also want to talk about the third class, which is a class called Turbillaria. These are the good guys of the flatworm group. They tend to be free living. The best example of an animal in this class is called the Planarian. These guys sort of look like a little cartoon character, and I'll show you a picture in a second. They, are for the most part, are freshwater. There are a few that live on salt water, a few that live on land. Most are really small, less than one centimeter in length. But there's one that lives mostly in Africa. It's called the giant land planarian, and it can be huge. It can be up to six meters, which is like 20 feet or more. So it can be a big worm. They tend to feed on dead stuff, though. They're basically saprophytes. They're decomposers. Um, they're not harmful to anything. You can find them in the Flint River. This is the life cycle of a schistosome worm. This is the one um, in that first class that typically can burrow through your skin. So you can see this guy's wading in fresh water. The larvae are living inside the water. They burrow into his skin. They get into his bloodstream, into his intestines. He passes out some of their eggs when he goes to the bathroom. Those end up in the water, grow into a larva. They have to inhabit a snail, a particular kind of snail in that water. If the snail is in that body of water, they'll grow. Some of those larvae will then leave um, the snail in a different form and go on to infect another person. This is looking at a tapeworm, and it shows you the life cycle of a tapeworm. Here's the basic shape. Again, you get the tapeworm by eating undercooked meat. And you can see here the cyst found in the muscles of animals like cows or pigs. When you eat that, if it's not cooked well, those eggs will hatch out inside your digestive tract and form a worm that looks like this. This worm will then attach to the walls of your small intestine and basically absorb nutrients. It's a parasite. As it's doing that, it's reproducing, and some of its segments will break off, and you will pass those out when you go to the bathroom. If those get on the ground, uh, they can stay there for a long time. Another animal comes along and eats those um, segments. It will then get um, tapeworms, which will form cysts in its muscles, and it could come back around and infect someone else. This is showing you a tapeworm inside a person through an x-ray. They can be very, very long. This is the head of a tapeworm. It's called the scolex. And notice the hooks on it. These are going to hook into the walls of your intestines. Um, the segments of a, of a tapeworm are called proglottids. And again, during reproduction, those, those proglottids are going to fill up with eggs and eventually break off and be passed out of your body. This is the planaria. This is the free living um, type of uh, flatworm. Here you can see that it has eye spots. These eye spots don't actually let it really see, but they let it sense light so it knows whether to move to or away from light. Also notice that its ferrets and its mouth are basically on its, uh, it's, on its ventral side, underneath its body. Uh, this tube can be extended and that's how it takes in food through this uh, pharyngeal tube. It also has a couple of ganglia up near its head. These are concentrations of nerves, sort of like a primitive brain. It does have some cephalization, which means it has some sense organs up here in the head. And that's where we're going to stop. See you on Monday.